Okay, we are now live with today's episode of Prehistory A Traveler's Guide. I am your lead host, Greg Nyman, and on the host on the panel today is AK Rex from YouTube, Arsene Kazarian. Hello, how are you doing guys? AK Rex here. And then on the other corner we have the editor of Prehistoric Times, Mike Fredericks, and the guy who helped make this interview possible. What's up? And joining us to talk ichthyosaurs and some other Scottish Green Reptiles is Monster Hunter Scott Mardis. Hello. And our, lastly, we're lastly for our guest of honor today, we are proud to present to you Dr. Stephen L. Brasati, the University of Edinburgh. Welcome to our show, uh, Stephen. Hi everybody. Hi from Scotland. Uh, born born American, but living in the good old Highland in the Highlands of Scotland. <laughs> That's right. He has a terrible Scottish accent. Yeah, I won't give it a go because uh, I don't want to offend anybody trying to do my Sean Connery or groundskeeper Willie. <laughs> uh, St Stephen, maybe it would be a nice uh, try to see if you can do a Glaswegian accent. That oh, would be pretty I was interesting. just in Glasgow this weekend, and it's you know hard enough for me to carry on a conversation, to be honest, with, with some folks in Glasgow, <laughs> much less trying to put on the accent. So I will pass and spend I, my time talking about dinosaurs. <laughs> I actually lived there for four years before, so yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah, so you know, you know. Oh, definitely, definitely, yes. Yeah, but... London yeah. and Glasgow is a very big contrast. Mm, yes. Is it there? So has everybody got their afternoon tea ready, or is it a morning tea for some? Yeah, it was, it was coffee for Mike. <laughs> I just had a simple morning breakfast here and some uh, allergy medication, so I wouldn't be sniffling during this whole presentation. Fair enough. Yep, yep, it's just been lunchtime, but I think, uh, you know, dinosaur time now, so I'm really excited to talk to you guys and tell you a little bit about some Scottish, you know, fossils, Scottish dinosaurs, some of the work you know, that we've been doing here, and then um, just about dinosaurs more generally, and about this new book I have coming out uh, in a very, very shortly called The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. So I'm happy to start fielding some questions whenever you guys are ready. Okay, I think a simple way to start off as well to give us and our audience a little uh, background on yourself, uh, Stephen, like, your um, early life and what led you to residing in Scotland and choosing to take up, you know, a tenure at the University of Edinburgh and what got you interested in the evolution of uh, dinosaurs specifically? Yes, so I'm at the University of Edinburgh now um, in Scotland. It's, it's one of the main universities here. Very old university goes all the way back to the 1580s uh, and kind of a strange place for somebody like me to end up because I grew up in uh, the Midwestern U.S. I grew up in northern Illinois and uh, I became in dinosaurs and fossils and paleontology back when I was in high school. Uh, Mike knows the story well because way back then when I was 14 or 15 years old, I got in touch with Mike. I started reading Prehistoric Times. I really you know, started to send Mike a lot of articles. I was big into to writing articles and doing interviews of paleontologists. This was a little bit before the time of blogging. Uh, and so nowadays, if I was getting into it at that age, I'd probably start a blog. But back then, around 1999, 2000, and I started submitting stuff to prehistoric times and and I you know still write for for Mike um, but that pr uh, whole kind of process as, as a, a teenager uh, really uh, got me into paleontology as a science um, and uh, by the time I left high school I knew I wanted to study it and so I went off to college to study geology and I went to the Univers University of Chicago and studied under Paul Serino uh, and so, you know, very, very famous dinosaur hunter, discovered dinosaurs all across the world. And then afterwards, I did a master's degree in England in, in uh, Bristol um, with another very famous paleontologist, Mike Benton. And then I came back to the U.S., did my Ph.D. in New York at uh, the American Museum of Natural History and at, at Columbia with yet another very famous paleontologist, Mark Norell, who's you know, well known for leading these expeditions to the Gobi Desert for over 25 years now and brought back all kinds of tyrannical 
tyrannosaurs and raptors and uh, all kinds of dinosaurs. Uh, and then afterwards, I came over here to the UK. And so I study dinosaurs um, for my career. I, I do the normal academic thing. I teach. I run a lab. I advise students. And, and I do a lot of research. And I, I particularly study the anatomy and the genealogy and the evolution of dinosaurs and other fossil vertebrates. And I'm interested in how evolution works uh, over very, very long time scales. I'm really interested in how the Earth has changed over time and what dinosaurs tell us about those things. That really sounds sounds awesome, uh, Stephen. I've got <clears> some <throat> fits over right here. I've got a set of questions here from Facebook member uh, Brendan Lee. I'll submit here in the chat here. Right. Yeah, so let me take a look here. So, let's see. All right, quite a lot of questions here. So let's take the first one. So which ty the, which Tyrannosaur um, is most interesting uh, as far as Tyrannosaurs that I'm working on? Um, I love Tyrannosaurs. They're really f just fascinating dinosaurs. I think everybody feels the same way. There's no doubt T-Rex is the most famous of all dinosaurs. Uh, you could show a picture of T-Rex to pretty much anybody on the planet, and I think they'll know what it is. And to me, it is just really fascinating that evolution produced an animal like this that was the size of a bus and weighed seven or eight tons and could crush through the bones of its prey. And so I've studied Tyrannosaurs for a long time. I've studied uh, T-Rex and also its close cousins. And the, the, the newest one, the one that we uh, have been working on most recently, is this one from Uzbekistan called Timurlengia. It's a new species that we described a few years ago. And it's a, a, an older tyrannosaur. It's a more primitive tyrannosaur. It's only about the size of a horse, but it helps us understand how T-Rex got so big. And it tells us that tyrannosaurs started out small. They were not top predators. Uh, but while they were small, while they were living in the shadows of, of other giant predators, they started to evolve bigger brains, and they got smarter, and they evolved keener senses, and those are the things that helped them uh, become so big and helped T-Rex rise uh, to the top. So that's the tyrannosaurs. <laughs> a little bit about the tyrannosaurs. Um, I can go through the rest of these questions if you want me to. Is that what you'd like me to do? Uh, yeah, sure, go right ahead. Sure. So then the second question is, um, have I seen, you know, dinosaur documentaries and films, things like, you know, Jurassic Park and Godzilla? Of course, absolutely. Um, I've seen, you know, all the Jurassic Parks. I remember seeing the first one in the cinema. It was a little bit before I became interested in dinosaurs. I was just, um, you know, nine years old at the time. But my youngest brother really loved dinosaurs. And so we went to the cinema to see it. And I just remember being blown away by it. Now, I'm very much looking forward uh, to seeing the new one. Uh, this summer. So I, I enjoy those shows. And I've, you know, done some documentaries myself. I've been involved in some like the T-Rex autopsy that was on Nat, Nat Geo um, a few years ago. That was one that, that I appeared on cutting up this life-size model of a T-Rex, blood and guts and internal organs and, and skin and feathers and all. Um, and then, you know, I've been a talking head on some other documentaries and I always love um, doing that kind of work, you know, talking to the public about dinosaurs. Um, Okay, the next question is, what's the first thing I do when I'm working uh, in the field? I mean, it really depends where we're working, but uh, Scotland is a place now where I'm doing a lot of work since I'm based here. There's not a lot of dinosaurs from Scotland. It's not like the Gobi Desert or the Sahara Desert or the Badlands out, out in the western U.S. Um, it's not that rich in fossils, but there are dinosaur bones here and dinosaur footprints. And we can find them on a place called uh, the Isle of Skye, this really beautiful island that's off the west coast of Scotland, an island in the Atlantic. And it's a little bit non-traditional fieldwork there. It's not the desert. It's not brushing sand off of bones. It's not the Indiana Jones style, you know, field expeditions, but it's cold. It's wet. It rains a lot. Uh, it's really windy. Most of the, the sites where we find the fossils are on the coast, so we have to deal with the tide. So we have to plan really carefully when we're going to go out to make sure we're there at low tide or when the tide is falling. Uh, and we do use rock hammers and chisels, but the rock is so hard there, we often have to use diamond tip saws to get the bones out. So that's, you know, just a little taste of some of the field work um, that we're doing. Um, the next question here is, uh, will we ever find feathered tyrannosaurs or carcarodonosaurs? Uh, feathered tyrannosaurs, yes, we already have them. So D-long, 
uh, is this very primitive dog-sized tyrannosaur from China, and it was found covered in, in feathers. And there's a bigger tyrannosaur from China called Eutyrannus, which is about eight or nine meters long, so about 30 feet long or so, probably weighed one or two tons. Uh, it's also been found covered in feathers, but these are feathers that are quite unlike the feathers of birds today. They're, they're very simple. They're just individual strands, um, filaments, and they look a lot like our hair, actually. So they're the precursors of feathers. They're what modern bird feathers evolved from. Uh, we don't know if any Carcharodontosaurs were feathered, for sure. Carcharodontosaurs are this other group of giant meat-eating dinosaurs that thrived before the Tyrannosaurs got really big. And so there's some very famous species like Carcharodontosaurus itself, and Giganotosaurus, and Mapiosaurus, Acrocanthosaurus. Uh, we don't know if they had feathers. There's some arguments based on some marks on one of the, the arm bones of one of them uh, that they may have had kind of quill type of feathers that were anchored to the arm bone. It's a bit controversial, but my prediction would be that they probably did have some simple feathers. And so maybe someday somebody will, will find one. I think that would be great if somebody did. Um, the next question here on the list is, who is my favorite paleontologist? Wow, I mean, I've been very fortunate to have some great mentors uh, in the field, and Paul Serino and Mike Benton and Mark Norell. Um, I've also been really privileged to work with the great uh, diversity of paleontologists from around the world. And it's a great thing about this job is that I get to travel quite a bit um, and I get to do field work in, in lots of interesting places and I have colleagues all over the world and you know I've done work in China and Brazil in Romania and Portugal and Poland and Lithuania and in the US and Canada of course in the UK and other places as well uh, and so there's just a great um, group of paleontologists around the world now. There's more and more students that are studying paleontology. There's a lot uh, more young people that are studying paleontology. Uh, it's not just a, an old white guy's game anymore. There's there's a you know, much uh, larger number of female paleontologists these days, especially among the younger crowd, among students. Um, huge uh, diversity of, of, of paleontologists of lots of different backgrounds. China is really leading the way now. So, so many of the new fossils come from China. Um, so, that's just a roundabout way of saying I can't really pick a favorite paleontologist since I'm, you know, part of the community and I work with so many great paleontologists. Um, but I, I, you know, re really respect a lot of the greats that came before us, the people that built the field up to what it is today, from Mary Anning and Mantell and Buckland, you know, way back 200 plus years ago, up through people like Cope and Marsh and the Sternbergs and Andrews and Colbert and Ostrom and, and then Bacher and Horner and that whole group is really an incredible legacy that those paleontologists have built. Um, and then the last question here um, from Brendan is, do I have any advice uh, for kids who are interested in science? Yeah, I was one of those kids. And one of the best things I did was get in touch with Mike and start reading prehistoric times, start seeing what the community was like, meeting people in the community and learning about new discoveries. Um, and having the chance to write for prehistoric times for me was a great thing because I like to write and so it kind of made me part of the community and it gave me a reason to learn things, to research things. Um, for kids today, I think there's so many great resources on the internet. I mean, you can set up a Google News Alert, you can follow new dinosaur discoveries as they're made. Uh, there's so many museums that have digital resources online. You can see interactive exhibit halls online. Um, and there's still a lot of great books out there. There's a lot of great museums to visit in person. And if you're really interested in the science, uh, it's probably good to try to do some volunteer work. If you can volunteer, go out on a dig, meet some paleontologists, but definitely take as many science courses and math courses as you can in school because all of that stuff matters. Chemistry and physics and biology and geology, those things all form a part of what paleontology is. Um, but don't forget about writing, don't forget about communication skills, you know, it's a field that's so popular to the public um, that it's really fun to to reach out and, uh, and uh, talk to dinosaurs and talk, you know, to, to everybody out there that are interested in dinosaurs. So those are Brendan's questions. And so, all right, <laughs> that's a bit long-winded, but six questions, I hope I did them justice.
I think Brandon will be satisfied with your uh, answers, uh, Doc, uh, Stephen. And I will let AK Rex field a couple of the ones that he and some of his buddies have gathered up for you. Yeah, great. Well, uh, AK Rex here now, and um, I uh, just wanted to start off by saying that I have had experience uh, listening to uh, Stephen's lectures before, and they're absolute pleasure to listen to. Just thought I'd start with that first. Thank you. I'm, gl I'm gl very glad to hear that. And um, uh, I've got, well, uh, uh, Greg, uh, Greg made a bit of an understatement here uh, because it's uh, about 10 questions I've got all together. Are you ready for this one? I'm ready. I'll try to answer them a bit, bit more quickly if I can than the sure. last one. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> sure, sure. No worries. Uh, so, uh, well, let's start one by one. So first one, this is from uh, some of my friends. Uh, it uh, says, what are your thoughts on uh, Barker et al. 2017 uh, paper that's basically described some uh, uh, detailed structures on the neovenator salary and uh, Ibrahim et al. 2014 about uh, Spinosaurus uh, regarding the facial sensory systems. And uh, does this mean that given that we have a similar discovery now with uh, Car et al. 2017 as well, is this something that you could, uh, you know, hypothesize whether or not it's uh, going to be found commonly, uh, you know, in large theropods all the way around across the board? Or uh, would we likely be seeing this as a unique feature to these groups? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, and this comes down to this network of, of nerves and blood vessels that invade the snouts of, of some animals. And that these are the things that feed the uh, sensory system. So kind of a tactile sensory system. Um, if you will, kind of you know, similar to like what the whiskers of, of cats and, you know, and mammals today do. Not exactly the same, but that sort of tactile system. Um, I, from, as far as I know, the first time that this network of blood vessels and nerves was identified in the snout of a fossil reptile was actually by my current PhD student, Davide Fofa, um, who, when he was a master's student, he CAT scanned a skull of a marine reptile, a pliosaur, and found this network uh, inside there. And then later on, Ibrahim et al. found it in uh, Spinosaurus, and Barker et al. found it in Neovenator, and Thomas Carr and his colleagues found it in Tyrannosaurus and Daspletosaurus. So I think it's a pretty common thing. And I think the more uh, CAT scans we do of dinosaur skulls, my prediction is that we'll see that this is something that was present in a lot of dinosaurs, and they probably had a really sensitive snout that they use to touch and to communicate with each other and, and, and in hunting, of course, too. Awesome source. So thank you very much for uh, tackling that one down. That really takes care of it. And uh, uh, let's uh, go to question two. Um, so uh, question two is, uh, do you know if there has been any more initial studies or reports or pictures released on the preserved fossil skin of uh, Carnotaurus beyond the uh, Bonaparte abstract? Uh, I don't. Simple, simple answer okay. to that, but I don't. I know it's out there. Um, it hasn't been that well described, and I hope to see it described because it's a really important uh, fossil. Fair enough. Uh, that was a quick one. Uh, indeed. Uh, now, number three. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Juvi Allosaur fossil skin, and um, is there more Allosaurus fossil skin out there uh, beyond this? That's report. You know, the one that's reported. I believe it's Huntington material. If I'm correct, I could be obviously getting this wrong, but there is a material of a juvenile Allosaurus uh, nicknamed, sorry if I'm butchering the name, Juman Seni, reported from Mailing Quarry in Wyoming, and uh, it's uh, in an SVP poster of 2003. Does that ring a bell at all to you? To be honest, it doesn't. I don't know that fossil. I, I certainly haven't seen it myself, so I, I'm afraid I don't have any opinion on it, but I hope that's uh, described uh, soon, too. And I think there's so many fossils out there, and there's such a backlog, uh, so there's so many amazing discoveries that still need to be described, and this sounds like one of them. Sure enough. Now, this one here is the personal research question for myself. And it's a subject that I've been trying to um, obviously address in, uh, at every opportunity when I get a chance to talk to uh, paleontologists like yourself and uh, some of your colleagues as well that I've had pleasure of dealing with. And uh, this is the one that uh, goes like that. Uh, do you believe that the decline and eventual disappearance of uh, Allosauroidea in general was related to more and more herbivores developing armor in a variety of forms? That's the first part of the question. Now, the second part of the question is, 
as a follow-up, and could this in turn have been a trigger for Tyrannosaurids to evolve and thus develop uh, a more powerful um, body plan with more powerful jaws and teeth that were better able to deal with armored prey? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I do think that the decline of Allosauroids was what paved the way for Tyrannosaurs to become really big and to become apex predators. So in uh, the middle to late Jurassic and then into the early to middle Cretaceous, you know, quite a long span of time, you had Allosauroids that were living all over the world and they got to be really big. The Carcharodontosaurids are a type of Allosauroid. And so some of them got up to, you know, 40 feet long and several tons, you know, almost T-Rex size. Uh, maybe some were even a little bit bigger than T-Rex. There's debate about that. And so they were the top predators for a long time, but then sometime in the middle Cretaceous, kind of, you know, somewhere around 90 90 million years or so ago, they declined and most of them died. Uh, we don't really know why. Um, it could have something to do with an arms race with prey, but I don't know. You know, there was lots of armored prey early on in the early Jurassic and in the middle Jurassic. You know, that's when the ankylosaurs and the stegosaurs evolved, uh, for instance. And so, it's not like the first armored dinosaurs, you know, kind of suddenly appeared in the early Cretaceous and then right afterwards the Allosaurs declined. It's not a neat story like that. So I think we just don't really know why the Allosaurs declined. But when we see the Allosaurs become rare and essentially disappear from the fossil record, that is right when we see Tyrannosaurs become really big and become really common in North America and Asia. So it looks like the Allosaurs, something happened to them. Most of them died, and then the Tyrannosaurs took advantage. They kind of moved into the, the vacant house, if you will, and that's what started the Tyrannosaur dynasty. Fair enough. That's a very interesting uh, uh, outlook on the question indeed. Uh, definitely lots to think about when I will be obviously dwelling deeper into this uh, personal project of mine. Um, and uh, one quick one, of course, here, that's your thoughts on uh, the validity of uh, taxon Sorophaganax. Yeah, good question. So there's this is a very big theropod somewhere again in that kind of 40 foot long, you know, several tons uh, in weight sort of size range. And there's debate about whether it's uh, its own separate species or whether it's a really big, old, mature, enormous individual of Allosaurus. And I don't have a firm opinion on that. Um, you know, I've studied Allosauroids. Uh, there's no doubt that that it's very similar to Allosaurus. It comes down to a few differences, you know, in, in some of the features of the bones. But regardless of whether it's a big Allosaurus or a separate species, uh, it's a big animal. And it tells us that Allosaurus could get really, really big in the late Jurassic. Fair enough. That's indeed very interesting. Um, uh, I, I, had, I heard rumors that uh, this is currently under revision, so we'll have to wait and see what comes out of it. I as hope well. so. Uh, you know, that would be great. That's one of the more important dinosaurs that's kind of been, you know, floating around in the ether for a while, um, but hasn't been properly described. So I, I look forward to that. And uh, what kind of difficulties have you experienced when it comes to fossil uh, poaching? What are your thoughts about that sort of thing? Well, fossil poaching is, is a scourge on the field. You know, it's illegal criminal activity um, that largely comes down to uh, organized crime in a lot of cases. Uh, so it's a bad thing. And it's very common in certain parts of the world. And the, the Gobi Desert is one place where there's a lot of poachers because there's a lot of dinosaurs out there. And it's really heartbreaking uh, to hear these stories of colleagues of mine finding a dinosaur skeleton, you know, not being able to excavate all of it. Uh, covering it up and then coming back a few months later or a year later and seeing that that it's been poached or that it's been partially destroyed or parts of it have been taken. Um, that's just a really tragic thing because these are priceless, you know, one of a kind fossils that are now basically lost to science. And a lot of them do enter the black market. And at that point, you know, we lose track of them. Sometimes they turn up in auction houses and auction catalogs and um, you know, in, in uh, you know, the homes of wealthy business people. Um, 
but it's not a good thing, you know, and, and there's separate issues. I mean, there's the issue of, of commercial fossil collecting in general, you know, whether fossils should be bought or sold. And that's a, a thorny issue. But uh, at least in the United States, you know, their property laws make clear that, hey, if it's your property, you find something on it, it's yours to do what you want with. That's fine. Nothing illegal there. If you want to sell it, you can do it. I would hope that, you know, if, if, if you find a, a beautiful dinosaur on your land, that you'd think about donating it to a museum so it could uh, be studied and it can be enjoyed by people it can be exhibited but it's your land you can do what you want but poaching is is something very different and that is illegal and that is bad and that is something that we have to do whatever we can to stop and it's something that makes me um you know very 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 sad when i think about it well thanks very much for answering that one if i ever find that tyrannosaurus uh, skeleton on my front yard i will uh, freely <laughs> donated to uh, the museum of uh, whichever uh, obviously established and accredited collection that is awesome. obviously a but but with one condition the specimen has to be nicknamed ak rex hey that's <laughs> the deal i'll take <laughs> i'm gonna get it to a museum once you find it of course um, then, uh, yeah ak rex no problem and that's but that kind of thing does happen and, and this is a great thing when that happens there's a lot of these fossils out there in museums that have nicknames because people find them and instead of of you know selling them off to the highest bidder they they you know either sell them to a museum or donate them to a museum and, and it's a wonderful thing because that means those fossils are safe they're preserved they're available for study they can be put on display they're not just going to disappear um, and fossils are so rare that um, each one is so, so, so important. And I think it's a great thing when, when collectors work with scientists that way. And, and that's happened here in Scotland. We named this new species of ichthyosaur, and we might get to that in a bit, this thing called Yarkvara a few years ago, the first Scottish ichthyosaur. And I wish I could say I found those fossils, but I, I didn't find them. It was an amateur collector, a, a, a guy named uh, Brian Shawcross, who was quite young when he found them. He was hunting for ammonites. He found some bones on the beach. He realized that nothing like that had been found in that area before and so we got in touch with the museum in this case the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow and they confirmed that these were a one-of-a-kind find and he could have kept them he could have put them on his mantle he could have put them in a shoebox under his bed he could have even put them up for auction but he donated them to the museum and that turned out to be the type specimen of this new species the first Scottish ichthyosaur that's ever been found and that's a just scientifically invaluable fossil and now the whole world knows about it because he donated it and we named it after him Yarkvara Shaw Cross Eye and I think that's a a really nice story and that shows that um, you know uh, we as scientists we love to work with collectors we can't be out there every day looking for fossils we have a lot of different parts of our jobs a lot of the days we're teaching or we're managing our labs and maybe we can only get out to look for fossils for a few weeks or a few months out of the year at most. And so working with collectors that uh, really know local areas, that know the laws, that have more time uh, to devote to collecting, we love doing that. We really, really do. That's amazing. That, I really loved this story as well that you just said here. It's uh, It really also shows uh, how... Uh, like you were saying it with such passion, I could almost feel the spirit of the scientist here. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. But I've got another interesting, also uh, a, a specific question here on um, alosauroids as well, but in, per in particular, a, a couple of carcarodontosaurids examples. Now, uh, to give you a bit of an intro here, what uh, I obviously we know from Caratal 17 about this event, uh, which was described as anagenesis, when uh, to when one species morphs into the other and thus became uh, different species of the same genera, but in a different period, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, what are your thoughts in the possibility of uh, anagenesis between Giganotosaurus carolini and Machiosaurus rosé, and whether or not the, there are there is a, enough ground to establish the necessary conditions for it? Yeah, this is a, a really good question. You know, anagenesis is, is one of these topics that um, we, we debate about it quite a bit, and it's a tricky thing to find evidence for in the fossil record. So anagenesis is basically when you have, you know, one species that's around, and then over time, 
that changes into something else, into another species. And that's different from another form of evolution we would call branching evolution or cladogenesis, where you have a species that's around and then somehow it's divided by a barrier uh, and so that species splits into two. So anagenesis, one species kind of gradually evolves into something else. Cladogenesis, you have one species that splits into two uh, new things. Um, anagenesis is, it's hard to find firm evidence in the fossil record because the fossil record is so poor when we get down to it. You know, it's very incomplete. Most fossils are really fragmentary. Only a tiny percentage of all animals that ever lived will ever be preserved as a fossil. And so you need to have those necessary conditions in the fossil record to show that anagenesis is possible. So you would need two species. They would need to be in the same place. Uh, one would have to come after the other. Uh, for anagenesis to be true, for, for, for it to be supported by fossils. So in the case of the tyrannosaurs like Daspletosaurus, um, that, uh, th those conditions are, are met. Anagenesis is plausible. You have two different species. One lives before the other. They're both from the same general place. So, and, and, we, and we can tell from the phylogenetic analyses, these cladistic analyses, that they're each other's closest relatives. So therefore, anagenesis is possible. Uh, with Giganotosaurus and Mapposaurus, they probably are each other's closest relatives. Um, but I would need to, to look into a lot more detail just the exact age of each species and the exact area where each one lived to see if it fit the bill for anagenesis. But it's possible. It's possible. So I think anagenesis is something that happens. I mean, it happens in nature. It happens in evolution. It's just really hard to find that definitive proof in the fossil record. But we'll probably find more examples the more that we look. And sure enough, and uh, knowing that uh, Allosaurus, as far as I'm aware, unless I could be confusing it, uh, is one of your primary specialties as well. So I would be interested to see if you would be up for the challenge to establish that sort of connection there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, one other uh, piece of work of the, uh, that you have done, which particularly uh, contributed quite a lot into the knowledge of uh, ph phylogeny, of Tyrannosauroid, yeah, it was the work that you have done with your colleague and I believe a friend as well, Dr. Thomas Carr, in 2016, um, the paper on Tyrannosauroid philo phylogeny. So, what are your key thoughts and points uh, for the viewers that you could outline to take home from this paper, if it's possible, of course, to uh, outline it like in this kind of manner at all? Yeah, yeah, and I know we're getting a little bit tight for time, so I won't wax on too long, but Thomas Carr and I, yeah, for, for many years we've been working on tyrannosaurs, and we've been building these data sets for phylogenetic analyses, um, and so over time, as, as we've studied more tyrannosaurs, as more tyrannosaurs have been found, we just built bigger and bigger data sets that encapsulate the ways that these tyrannosaurs vary how they differ from each other, the different features of their bones. And we use that, uh, we run that through some computer algorithms and that produces a family tree. So our most recent version was one that came out uh, a couple of years ago and it's just the most up-to-date comprehensive family tree of the group. It shows where T. rex fits among its relatives and it helps tell the story of how tyrannosaurs as a group got their start about 170 some million years ago in the middle Jurassic, more than 100 million years before T. rex. And for most of their history, tyrannosaurs were small. They were human size, kind of up to horse size, but living in the shadows, in the shadows of the Allosauroids, who were the top predators of, of the time, as we've been talking about. But only then later in the final 20 million years of the Mesozoic, the very end of the Cretaceous, did the Allosauroids mostly disappear and the tyrannosaurs came took their crown and became the top predators. And we know that story because of the family tree. Uh, what is interesting as well that I particularly, we discussed it in more detail actually with Dr. Thomas Carr on my channel uh, in one of the interview sessions that we've had. And uh, he, we pointed out that you have produced two very important analyses where you collected a lot of the data that has been previously done by other colleagues of yours. And uh, thus you came up with a parsimony analysis and you came up with the Bayesian analysis, which illustrates uh, the phyl phylogeny tree quite well for those who want to understand them better. So that was very interesting indeed as well. 
Yep, that's right. And we're using all sorts of new techniques, new statistical techniques. And these Bayesian techniques are some of the more sophisticated ways to build family trees um, using some pretty intensive uh, computing power. Uh, lovely, jubbly. So well, my final question uh, probably would be uh, here, if you, whether or not you have a favorite pet hypothesis of your own, whatever that one is, that's the first part of the question. Second part of the question would be, what evidence and clues do you hope to discover in order to uh, make this hypothesis more defensible and eventually, hopefully, shine more light on it? Well, you know, there's lots of different studies I've done and, and different things that I've hypothesized. But I, I guess I'd like to draw you know, our attention to something that I don't know the answer to, something that bugs me and, and is a real mystery to me. And that's the question of why dinosaurs were able to rise up and become dominant in the first place. And we know some of that story. We know that it took dinosaurs a long time. The first dinosaurs evolved in the Triassic period, right after the end Permian extinction, when the world was recovering. Uh, but so did many other groups of animals. And the crocodile group evolved at that time as well. And the crocodile group was really outpacing the dinosaur group throughout the Triassic. There were more of these crocodile line reptiles. They were more diverse. They were more abundant. They lived in more places. Some of them got to be really, really big. There were some, you know, nearly bus sized uh, croc type animals. Um, and then at the end of the Triassic, Pangaea started to split up, the supercontinent, it started to break apart, and these big volcanoes started to well up and, and erupt through the cracks of the supercontinent, and that caused another mass extinction, and that really hammered the crocodiles. Only a few species survived, and those are the ones that led to today's crocodiles, their ancestors. But dinosaurs, on the other hand, sailed right through. Dinosaurs just kept on trucking, and we don't know why. We don't know what it was about dinosaurs that allowed them to survive that extinction that killed off so many of their croc competitors. That's what I want to know the question, the answer to, and I don't have a good answer to that question. I think it's something that the next generation of paleontologists are going to have to figure out. That's very interesting indeed. It could be actually drawn with a parallel of how did a variety of other species survived while dinosaurs all just all of a sudden went extinct as well in that same period that led to the Cretaceous when the Great Extinction occurred. So it's a, it's a very kind of interesting sort of thing to observe how there was a time when dinosaurs survived and thrived, but then obviously dinosaurs disappeared for some reason. Others did not, and uh, they became these mammals and in different forms and shapes which they never occurred, you know, in the previous periods because the niches were all occupied and other reasons. <laughs> so, yep, yep. It's an incredible story. And I say this is just, this is the, the story I tell in, in my book. And just to get I got to get a plug in for the book, of course, my publishers would kill me otherwise. But the book will be coming out in late April and it's called The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. And it tells the story of dinosaur evolution. So a lot of the things we're talking about, you know, how dinosaurs rose up to dominance, how the tyrannosaurs went from small to big, you know, what happened to the allosaurs, then what happened to the dinosaurs when they ultimately went extinct, you know, except for the birds. Uh, you know, I tell that story in, in the book and it's the sort of thing I know I could speak for hours about. We don't have hours and hours here, but I think a lot of you will, will um, enjoy the book book and a lot of the stories I tell there. I wanted to actually uh, quickly before I finish up with my portion because my questions have already run out but uh, since you mentioned that the book is coming out uh, relatively soon um, I was wondering would you be interested in coming to my channel and maybe we could have a proper in-depth discussion split into multiple parts and discuss your book and along with some other pieces of your work as well for the viewers. Yeah, just get in touch with me a bit later on when we have some time to chat. But yeah, we'll pick that up uh, once we finish here. Yeah. Okay, lovely. I will try to find a way to uh, get in touch with you. And in the meantime, I suppose I'll just pass over the mic to the next uh, speaker and uh, see what questions they come up with. Right. Thank you very much for answering everything. Yep, Indeed, I'm, I'm going to be here. Uh, most of the time listening and uh, if anything interesting comes up I will probably uh, comment or something but in, in any case I enjoy listening to you more than actually talking in a sense <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much uh, Stephen and, uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure yeah hi Steve it's Mike here um, <laughs> thanks so much for doing this uh, it's really really awesome um, and uh, you were saying nice things about prehistoric times 
as members of our mutual admiration society, I gotta say your book is great. Having a magazine means I get uh, copies of books before they've come out, so I already got to read it. And uh, a plug for Prehistoric Times magazine. I even interview Stephen about Steve. Sorry, Steve about the uh, book in uh, in my magazine. But one last thing about it. it, it it's not like Steve's a professor when he talks to you, and it feels like he's talking to you in his book. It's just like you're having a conversation with Steve. You can hear how he talks right now, and you don't realize you're learning, <laughs> but you're learning. It's, it's just really, really a, a well-written book. And one thing I don't think you said, Steve, was that your line was not a direct line to paleontology so much because you were thinking about being a journalist uh, at one time, and that shows in everything you write and the way you talk and everything else. But anyway, well, thanks, Mike. Here's, 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 you've always been a great, you know, a, a, a great supporter of mine and given me a lot of opportunities. And, and you know, I was very fortunate to get to know you and, and um, you know, some of the others, Alan Devis and Lynn Close and others in the uh, paleo kind of amateur uh, magazine community back when I was a teenager. And it was just such a help for me. And it really, you know, established... Um, established my my career in this stuff so i'm very pleased that you like the book and thanks again for you know reviewing it and doing the interview for pt yeah well as i joke to you alan debus and i call you our favorite son <laughs> anyway so my question is um what i promised i would ask you uh and this came out of england where you well the uk where you basically are and um our whole um theories about um Dinosaurs has kind of been turned over on its head by this uh, new notion that um, the theropods are not the the lizard hipped, and the uh, other sauropods and everything are not are not the bird hipped, but it's the other way around, which it always seemed to make more sense to me because the theropods are what turned into birds, so shouldn't they be the bird hipped? And now. Some people are saying they are. What do you say about that? Yeah, this is one of the big debates that's going on right now. And this is a new debate. And, you know, it, it, it was only about one year ago that the first shots were fired in, in, in this debate. And it all has to do with the dinosaur family tree, how the major groups of dinosaurs are related to each other. Um we there's so many dinosaurs there's over 1500 species that we know of and you know people are finding 50 new ones a year you know a new species a week this remarkable period golden age of paleontology but you can distill all of these dinosaurs down into three major groups there's the theropods you know the meat eaters like t-rex and velociraptor and birds then there's the sauropods or sometimes we call the sauropodomorphs and these are the long neck dinosaurs the big uh you know, long neck, small head, pot bellied, column limb ones like Brontosaurus and Diplodocus. And then the third group is the Ornithischians, the uh, mostly plant eating dinosaurs, mostly with beaks, with the so called bird hips, where the pubis points backwards. Um, and these are things like Triceratops and duck billed dinosaurs and Stegosaurs and Ankylosaurs. Now, all the way back to the 1870s, 1880s, these groups have been recognized. And they've been classified further into the saurischian ornithischian dichotomy. So the sauropods and the theropods have been placed together as saurischians, and the ornithischians have been placed to the side. And that's because of the hips. The saurischians have one type of hip, the ornithischians have another type of hip. In the saurischians, the pubis bone at the front of the pelvis, it points forward. And that's like modern-day lizards. So saurischian means lizard-hipped. In the ornithischians, like triceratops and the duck-billed dinosaurs, that pubis bone points backwards. And that's similar to what modern birds have. And so that's why they're called ornithischians, bird-hipped. Now that dichotomy between saurischians and ornithischians, that's persisted really until now, and, and until last year when this new cladistic analysis instead found that the ornithischians, the ones with the bird hips, are grouped with the theropods, and it's the sauropods that are off on their own branch of the family tree. And so now this, this uh, theropod ornithischian group uh, is called Ornithoscalida. That's the, the name that's uh, come up. Now, 
the, the debate is a really nuanced one. It all has to do with the results of these cladistic analyses, which are based on these huge data sets, lists of characteristics of the skeleton that are assessed in all of these different dinosaurs, you know, the presence or absence of different bones, differences in the size and shape of bones. And so little changes to those data sets can produce entirely different trees. And so that's the, where we're at right now. So when this new idea of theropods and ornithischians being united in this new group uh, was presented last year, some of us got together um, and decided to assess the data set that was being used to get this really iconoclastic new result. So a uh, uh, Brazilian paleontologist, Max Langer, who's uh, discovered and described a lot of the most important um, early dinosaurs from the Triassic, he put a team together of people from around the world, and I was one of them, uh, to take a second look at that new data set. And we went through it, and we noticed what we thought were a lot of issues with it, some mistakes, and we corrected those things, and then we re-ran it, and we got the traditional family tree. Uh, but we did some statistical analyses, and we found that none of the family trees were really any better than the others. They were all indistinguishable from each other in a statistical sense. It's like, you know, is a person who's a five foot eight, uh, you know, really different statistically from somebody who's five foot eight, eight and, you know, uh, one eighth of an inch. I mean, tiny, tiny little differences. And so we don't really know right now for sure what the family tree is. It is an open area of debate. Each new discovery is probably going to tell us something new, each new fossil. Um, we'll continue to probably argue about all these characteristics in these big data sets. We'll continue to run these things in our computer programs using different software, different algorithms, and it might be some time before it's resolved. And so that might seem a little bit frustrating, but I think it's quite exciting because for so long we thought we knew dinosaur classification. We thought we knew what the family tree was. Now it turns out that we don't, and it's an open question, and it's like all of a sudden, you know, not really knowing whether the person you thought was your grandmother was really your grandmother or whether it was really your great aunt, you know. So this is this is exciting. This is a mystery. And it's going to be that way for, for a while. Yeah, that's probably the most complicated answer you gave up during this interview. It's, yeah. It really it's is. Awful. Well, I mean, that's fine. It's, it really is a big deal, a big mystery. Um, but uh, I, I want to say one thing. Um, I interview Steve in the next issue of Prehistoric Times. Please go to prehistorictimes.com. Now back to you, Scott. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Well, I am uh, primarily interested in the marine reptile work you've done. I I know that there's been a lot of marine reptile stuff found in the Hebrides, but I, I also know there's some stuff been found on the east coast of Scotland over around Elgin, the East E, and the Black Isle. That's right. Yep. And I just thought maybe you could fill us in about what you've been personally involved with, with the marine reptile discoveries in Scotland. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, most of my work is on dinosaurs, and I am working more on mammals these days, the mammals that lived right after the dinosaurs, to try to understand how modern mammals evolved out of that, uh, that hellscape when the asteroid hit. Uh, but one of the other things I work on um, is uh, marine reptiles. And really that's because I'm based in Scotland now and there are marine reptiles here. And so I have several students that are working on marine reptiles, things like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, but even maybe more interesting than those groups, at least to me, is this really strange group of marine crocodilians called the Thalatosuchians. And these lived in the Jurassic uh, and into the Cretaceous. And these were crocodiles that essentially did what whales did. They started on land and they moved into the water and they completely changed their bodies in order to do so, in order to live in the water. So they ditch their armor and streamline their bodies. They turn their limbs into flippers. Uh, they they fluked their tail. They evolved big salt glands in their head so that they could swallow seawater. Um, all kinds of crazy changes to their skeletons. And, and those are really interesting. We do have some fossils of those in Scotland. A lot of those come uh, from England and from other parts of Europe. But as far as the Scottish marine reptiles go, uh, we're really starting to find more and more of them. 
there haven't been a lot that have been found over time. The one I mentioned earlier, Yarkvara, was really the, the first one. And, and this was you know found by Bar Brian Shawcross several decades ago and then donated to the Hunterian Museum. And then we came across it and started to study it. Uh, but that project really opened our eyes here uh, to the reality that there's a lot more marine reptiles. And some are hiding in museum collections. And we've been working on some of those in the National Museum of Scotland, in the Hunterian Museum. Uh, and some are out there in the field waiting to be found. So there are other ichthyosaurs here. There's one that we uh, announced a few years ago that we haven't studied it to the point yet where we know if it's a new species or not, but we put it on display in Edinburgh and we had it prepared out by Nigel Larkin, a great preparator here uh, in the UK. Uh, and this is, so far, it only has a nickname. We call it the Storlox Monster, but it's an ichthyosaur that's known from a skeleton, a really nice skeleton, a hundred or so bones, mostly ribs and vertebrae, uh, from the Isle of Skye. So that's the next one we have to figure out. Is it a new species? There's another ichthyosaur from Skye uh, that we're studying. Uh, and then there's other bits and pieces of plesiosaurs as well mostly from sky but as you say there's also some from the east coast there's a few bits and pieces that have been found uh at uh, ethy uh in that in the black isle area that's not too far from inverness so not uh, too far from loch ness for those that know your scottish geography just a fairly short drive and then there are also some from a little bit farther north on the east coast around the Helmsdale area. That's way up, you know, almost to the, the tip of the, the Scottish mainland, the northern tip. Uh, so, you know, we still don't know a lot about Scottish marine reptiles, but we're finding more and more of them. We know there was a diversity of them back in the middle Jurassic, 170 some million years ago, when dinosaurs were thundering across the land. We had all these reptiles in the water, and we know that ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and these Salatosuchian crocs all lived here in Scotland. And we'll be going out doing more field work this spring uh, on the Isle of Skye and other places in Scotland, and hopefully we find some more marine reptiles, because the more I learn about them, the, the more and more they fascinate me. Well, thank you for addressing that. Okay, sorry if I've been talking for so long. Just wait for you guys to finish up here. I'll field the final sets of questions that I have, plus the ones that others have submitted. And I'll start with the one that Jeremy Hers, the Pillar Arson Deviator, suggested here. He wanted to know where you got the inspiration for your theory that Tyrannosaurus Rex is of Asiatic origin as to whether or not it outcompeted the American Tyrannosaurus already living on the continent at the time of its uh, evolution. Yep, this comes from the family tree. So the family tree that Thomas Carr and I built from this big data set of, of anatomical features uh, of tyrannosaurs, it shows that T-Rex is nested within a group of Asian tyrannosaurs. So it's that relationship. It's seeing that T-Rex's closest relatives uh, were Asian that leads us to hypothesize that T-Rex was some kind of immigrant that came over from Asia at the very end of the Cretaceous and swept through North America. But you know, that idea could be wrong. And if somebody finds a very close cousin of T-Rex from North America, that would then upset, you know, the family tree there. And so this is very much something we've just proposed based on the family tree that we have now, but we need to keep testing it as we find more fossils. That's a pretty good, uh, it makes sense. Anyhow, I'll still field two more of uh, say my friend Samuel Eilers' questions here. His, his, his part one is, how, are we, how much are we definitely able to tell about how the fossils of dinosaurs worked in? Part two, how do you think dinosaurs might have evolved if they had not gone extinct at the KT, KTG extinction event? Yeah, mussels, you know, it's not an area of expertise for me, but there are several scientists, you know, great scientists out there that study dinosaur musculature and locomotion. People like John Hutchinson, who's done a lot of the computer modeling work uh, for uh, T-Rex and for other dinosaurs, some great young paleontologists uh, in the UK. Uh, people like Charlotte Brassy, Carl Bates, Peter Falkingham, some names just to look into their papers. Susie Maidment's done a lot of work on ornithischians. Over in the U.S., my uh, college, fellow college, Sereno uh, lab buddy Sarah Birch uh, recently finished her Ph.D. a few years ago on T-Rex muscles, and so she's gearing up to publish that, and it's really cool work that will help show what those puny little arms of T-Rex are actually for. I won't give away the answer because she hasn't published it yet, but that's something to look out for. This is going to be a huge paper uh, uh, when it comes out. Uh, so there's just a lot of cool work 
on muscles um, now. Uh, as far as what would happen if the, you know, if the end Cretaceous extinction didn't happen, I'll be simple there. Dinosaurs would have persisted and mammals would have not got their chance. So I don't think we would have been here having this conversation. Yep, that's something we could say for more in-depth discussion another time. Indeed. And uh, this question about the field comes from uh, Raymond Minton. He wants to know, of all the myriad fossils that you and your team have discovered over years, what would you say has been the most you know, impactful on your uh, career, the most interesting? That's an uh, a, a interesting question to, to think about. I mean, one of the things great things you know that that that's happened is just i've got to work with so many interesting people and, and so many inter interesting fossils from all over the world and there's just two things i'd like to mention that i haven't hadn't really come up yet i've worked a lot in romania with a great group of friends there Matias Vremir, Zoltan Chikisava, some of the local scientists there are just they're they're great paleontologists they're great fossil collectors and this is a project i've been working on with them you know with mark norell all the way back to when i was mark's student they found some amazing dinosaurs there, including Belor, this dromaeosaur, this double sickle called dromaeosaur that Machias found uh, in the late uh, 2000s and that we described in 2010. Really amazing fossil, beautiful fossil, gorgeous, this small little poodle sized animal, but those two killer claws on each feet. And there's more just fascinating fossils that are coming out of Romania now, including some new dinosaurs that hopefully we'll be able to, to work on over the next few years, but also mammals and other things. And so it's been a huge privilege working with those guys. Uh, the other thing is I've got to work a lot in China, including on a lot of the feathered dinosaurs. So I work a lot with um, one of China's most famous dinosaur hunters, uh, Jun Chang Lu, who's a professor in Beijing. We described uh, Chongosaurus, this new tyrannosaur that we nicknamed Pinocchio Rex a few years ago, a close Asian cousin of T-Rex, one of those Asian cousins of T-Rex. And we've also described some feathered dinosaurs, including Zhenwan Long, this winged raptor, a close cousin of Velociraptor that had full-on wings. And it's been a lot of fun going to China and working with Jun Chong and going to some of these museums and seeing these new feathered dinosaurs. Uh, it, it, so, you know, those, those are some of the most amazing fossils that I've got to work on. Yeah, it seems every year we keep finding more and more incredible fossils from everything from uh, prehistoric birds or pre preserved cave lion cubs. I'm just curious to see if we'll ever find a full-on Tyrannosaur mummy. You know, someplace somewhere. That would be great. And you know what? It could happen because there have been hadrosaur mummies, you know, duck-billed dinosaur mummies from the same rocks that T. rex is found in. So one day somebody could find one. And that could help close the book on some of these debates we have about whether T-Rex had feathers and what color it might have been and what its lungs are like and its internal organs. So that is something I look forward to. I think that would be an amazing, amazing discovery. So do we have uh, time to fit in another quick question? We can, yeah, we can do one more here. If you, yep, and then I'll I mean, I see you. have to say goodbye <laughs> okay. to you guys. But. Sure. I see like everybody's gone silent for a little bit, so I thought <laughs> might as well fill in the space. In any case, I've got some, I've got the impression based on what you have already said, uh, Stephen, that you love to write. So as somebody myself who is currently working on uh, drums, medieval fantasy with dinosaurs. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a personal research question here and something that maybe would give you a nice exercise for creativity here as well a little bit. What are your personal thoughts and uh, uh, predictions in terms of how well would people, let's say from about 15th century to a type of period, if we're talking about like that sort of era, were able, would be able to survive in a world populated by dinosaurs? Specifically, maybe like think Lake Cretaceous and mixed with something like Late Jurassic, Morrison, Hell Creek, respectively. Wow, what a question! You know, <laughs> this gets into the sort of fantasy world that I'm very bad at writing about. I, I have no real, uh, you know, fiction uh, writing skills. I can tell a story about dinosaurs, but I'll leave the fiction, you know, to 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 you and to many listeners out there. I know a lot of you are are very into writing um, writing fiction and short stories. You know, I, I don't know. It, it, it's really, 
it's really something to think about. You know, how would humans deal with a T-Rex or, you know, an, an Allosaurus? Of course, in the modern world, you know, yeah, you'd probably just nuke it. But if it was, you know, humans from <laughs> a few centuries ago, back from a simpler time when there weren't such sophisticated weapons, you know, how would uh, earlier humans have, have dealt with dinosaurs? Um you know what? I I could only venture to think that it would have been similar in some ways to how humans dealt with the megafauna of mammals, mammoths and saber tooths and giant ground sloths and those kind of things. Um, that didn't end very well for the megafauna, but most of the biggest mammals were plant eaters and you didn't have T-Rex size, you know, meat eating mammals that, you know, the earliest humans had to deal with. So it would have been an unprecedented thing. And I think um, <laughs> there probably would have been quite a lot of death on both sides. I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, interesting thing as well is that uh, you don't exactly think you could bring a longsword to the fight when, on a, you know, and challenge a T-Rex on a duel really and expect to win in that fight as well. So <laughs> I wouldn't probably do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. And, uh, but uh, yes, I understand. Thanks very much. I mean, it's it's just a very good idea to think about how they would be able to adapt by building maybe fortifications, castles, and things. But in order to do that, they would have to be alive long enough to actually not get murdered by these T-Rexes and Allosaurs, so they could actually even have time to build something. So that's why I find this a very tricky question, and I'm really I really appreciate you actually giving it a good try. Catapults. Cat catapults, ballistas, yeah, what well, long ranged, and <laughs> yeah. in the forest it doesn't work. So it's only. <laughs> you right, to well, know? I'm going to have to let you go because I got to get back to uh, the business of running the lab and working with my students. I'm working with one of my students now on a paper we're trying to finish up on marine reptiles. So. Uh, yeah, Thanks. yeah, right. So, we're not us. buying, Steve. We know you're not. <laughs> But no, thanks it's a lot of fun. You. We could talk to you forever, but thanks for doing this. We'll have to do it again real soon. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Great conversation, really cool questions, and I think we covered a huge amount of ground in the small amount of time Absolutely. we had. So I hope you all enjoyed it, and I'll put in the final plug for my book. I know this is really shameless self-promotion here, but I think a lot of you listening will really like the book. So The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, it comes out in late April in the U.S., and a few days later in early May in, in the UK. Um, and, you know, I hope you check it out and I hope you enjoy. I certainly will, as it will become one of the main key subjects on my channel at some point. And uh, I wanted to ask, what's the best way to contact you uh, once we obviously go off the record, if that's all right? Great. Yeah, yeah, sure. Email. Just my over email. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, exactly. lovely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay, uh, thanks, guys. Thanks. So Talk to you later, then. Okay. Talk to you guys soon. Cheers. Yep. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yep. Thank Talk. you. All as I say, thank you very much for your uh, time today, Dr. Brasati. And we will <coughs> be welcoming you back on if you've got any new exciting research to share with us. And once the book is out, we've all had a chance to read it. We'll have a follow to discuss the finer, the finer details about what you've written in the new book. Okay, that's officially a wrap. This is Mr. Charles Scott, and I'm your host, Greg Donovan, signing off.